Our next speaker is Dave Kittleson from biology, who's going to get you involved with an activity you can touch. Thank you, Marva. So let me just say I am very glad that I have the lowest tech presentation today. This is all paper. We could go back to Jefferson's time and do this one. So I can almost close off the computer here. I should have known there's a little alien on the front. And that's probably a sign that there's going to be trouble. Anyhow, um, of the classes that I teach here at UVA, most of them are large classes. And so 100 or more students. And with the large classes, one of the very real challenges that I sense is being able to actively engage my students during the class time. And so one of the solutions or one of the responses to that challenge of trying to engage my students is creating demonstrations that involve the students in class and not just some, but actually every one of the students is involved in these demonstrations. And most of these demonstrations involve nothing more than a sheet of paper, a single sheet of paper. And so I wanted to show an example of one of those. And you've got one as this handout at the table here. Uh, there are sort of two parts to it. The top part is the demonstration itself. The bottom part is something that I'll talk about in another moment here. And I need to give you a little bit of background to make sense out of this particular demonstration. So this is one that I use in my Introduction to Immunology course. And specifically where we are in the course when we do this demonstration is that the students have already learned and become well aware of a very important fact, and that is that they, like you, can make millions of different antibodies. And so these millions of different antibodies allow us to deal with this world of potentially unlimited pathogens and be able to respond to those and to protect ourselves from the pathogens. Okay, so they know that they can make millions of antibodies. My students are also well aware of the fact that antibodies are proteins. And they also know from introductory biology that all proteins require a gene, which is the information for the amino acid sequence of the protein. So now they're starting to get in some trouble in terms of the numbers. And specifically where the trouble comes in is when I remind them of something that they probably have heard and maybe didn't remember, which is that we humans have only 20 some thousand different genes. So we've got 20,000 genes. We can make millions of different antibody proteins. Numbers don't add up, right? And on top of that, some of our genes are for something other than our immune system, right? Everything else that makes us human. So part of it is, how does this work? How can we make millions of different proteins with 20,000 genes? And the solution to that is a really remarkable mechanism that is occurring within all of us. It's occurring within you at this very instant. And that is in your bone marrow, cells that are developing to become certain types of white blood cells, the cells that make these antibodies. What they do is they create a gene on the fly. So during the development of each individual antibody producing white blood cell, they pick random gene segments and stitch them together within the cell to make a functional gene. And so since there are all these different combinations, they can make all of those different types of antibodies. And so that's the solution, but there are also a couple of other issues that go along with that. And one of them I've tried to represent on the demo, and that is that these segments, these gene segments that get spliced together in the DNA to form a gene, the pieces are not all in the same orientation relative to one another. In some cases, two pieces that come together are facing the same direction. In other cases, the pieces that come together are not facing the same direction. They're pointed towards each other or away from each other on the chromosome. 
And so the question is, how does that work? It's like putting together a sentence with words. It's not okay if some of the words are reversed in the sentence, right? They all have to be in the same relative orientation. And so this demo is intended to get to some of those ideas, and it's one that I would like you to do as well right here, and that is, just like my students in class, I want you to be the machinery that recombines the DNA to create an antibody gene. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do is to go ahead and tear off these top two strips. So you can see there's just a little indication of where I want you to tear it. So if you just fold it and, and quickly pull it apart, you should have two strips that you'll see are absolutely identical. One is just a copy of the other. Okay, and so the reason for doing two is we're gonna consider two different scenarios here of bringing these segments together. What happens in the process? Okay, I'm hearing a lot of ripping, this is good. I think we're, we're almost there, right? Okay, so start with one of these, and what we're gonna bring together first, don't do it quite yet, but I'm just gonna kinda walk you through what we're gonna do, is we're gonna end up connecting one of these, what are called V for variable gene segments, and let's start with the one that's over in that two, three area. So I've just got those numbers so that we can identify positions here. We're gonna put that one together with what's called the J for joining gene segment. So you're the machinery on the first step, you're gonna put those together, and as this machinery, what you are is you're just a small group of proteins. And those proteins have the ability to recognize sequences in the DNA called signal sequences. And that's what this 7129 business or 9237 business is. These are the sequences that the machinery recognizes. So those will be your hands. And then this machinery, your hands, you, not only recognize those, but you have activities of breaking the DNA and rejoining the DNA. You do the cutting and the splicing. And specifically, you've, well, you're gonna have some simple rules. You're a protein. You bind to one thing, you have one activity. And those simple rules are that when you're making a recombination like this, a splice, you're gonna make two cuts, and the two cuts are always precisely between the seven of that sequence and then the coding part of the sequence, the V segment with a big arrow, or the J segment with a big arrow. So you're gonna make two breaks. So let's go ahead and let's give it a try here. Again, you're gonna to bring together, you're gonna to connect this V gene segment and this J gene segment. And so, two things. You're gonna break the DNA twice. So one break is here between the seven of the 7129 and the V. The second place to break is over here. So actually, let me give you by the top numbers, the locations. Your first break is at about three and a half. Across the top. I learn something every time I do this. Thank you. And the second break that you'll make is at a little more than 14 and a half across the top. Okay, so you've made those two breaks. You brought together the V and the J. The other thing that comes together, if you bring the sevens together, you get this small loop, right? And so at this point, I would be showing my students an electron micrograph that shows that these small loops of double-stranded DNA were identified in these developing antibody-producing cells in the body, and that provided some evidence for this mechanism occurring. Okay, let's try the second one. Now I'm gonna give better instructions. I've learned very much from you, thank you. So, Put those aside, because it's very important that we don't get that first pieces, those first pieces mixed together with the second set of pieces. So now you should be starting with a fresh chromosome here, right? Okay, so again, we're gonna do a recombination, not between this V segment 
and this J, but instead the middle V and the J. And you can see that these two are not pointing in the same direction as each other, right? So this is an example where one word is backwards compared to the other word that we need to put together to form a, a sentence. So here again, the cut places are gonna be for the V approximately where across the top? Where do you wanna make the break? Eight and a half, exactly. So you're gonna make one cut at eight and a half. And where is the second cut gonna be? Yeah, a little over 14 and a half, right? Okay, so this, you're the machinery again. You followed the same first rule. You made a cut between the, the, what's called the signal sequence here and the coding sequence in two places. Now you're gonna bring two things together. The two things you're gonna bring together, you've gotta to get that V and the J together. How are you gonna do that? Okay, somebody said turn it upside down. Turning it upside down, your V and your J go together. And now, how about the sevens? Can you put the sevens together? So can somebody hold up their paper once they've made both of those two joints? Okay, so what's different here compared to what you had before? Okay, so it's linear, right? Everything's together. That intervening piece did not fall out as a separate loop. Instead, it's retained, but as you said, it's reversed, right? So its orientation is simply reversed, but it's retained in the chromosome. And so one of the key points, or one of the key concepts here, is that the students see that as these gene segments have evolved, it didn't matter what orientation each one is. The same machinery, following the exact same rules, things work out one way or the other. And they work out because these signals, their position relative to each of the gene segments. Again, the, the outcome is getting things together. You can see that the V and the J now that are joined are pointing in the same direction. So that's one of the, the principles here. Um, okay, so I think the bigger question is, do these sorts of demonstrations, these paper things that students are actually working with and manipulating, does that influence student learning, right? Does it have a positive impact on student learning? That's, that's really the bottom line, the important question here. And where I have most formally been assessing student learning is specifically in my introductory biology class. And in intro bio, the way that I'm trying to assess student learning is that I've started doing a pre and post semester concept assessment. And so students take this test on basically the first day of class, and that's kind of the baseline. What is their pre-existing knowledge of really, really important concepts in biology? And then they take the test again at the end of the semester, and we look for learning gains on these key concepts in biology, or I'm looking for these learning gains. And the specific concept assessment that I use is one that the bottom part of this handout is, uh, is indicating, and that is a, a figure from that particular publication where these authors had developed this introductory cell and molecular biology concept assessment. And what you can see from the author's work in this particular figure that they published is that there are certain concepts that are more challenging than others in terms of students changing and, and acquiring a new understanding. And specifically, what looks like the challenge? Number 20, right? So number 20, what you can see is that at the beginning of the semester, not a lot of students understood it, and at the end of the semester, not many more understood it, right? Now, that's a really tough particular question. Question number 20 here requires that students understand the details of mitosis, the details of meiosis, 
they understand how they're similar, they understand how they are different, and they can relate all of that to an image of an actual chromosome. So it's not something that people can just memorize. They have to really understand all of those ideas and put it together. Now I've recognized for years, I've been teaching intro bio for a decade, that students struggle with understanding mitosis and meiosis and how they're similar and how they're different. And putting information, ideas together with things like images of chromosomes. And so I've also d developed a demonstration, one of these paper things that gets at those topics. And I know that you can't see it from there. The only reason I'm showing it to you is to convince you that yes, I have more than one of these paper demos. Okay, so this, at least from where you are, you can see this is different, right? But again, it's the same idea, where in class, with uh, some guidance, the students are working with this, they're folding things over, unfolding, breaking, rejoining, and this is getting at a lot of those ideas of mitosis, meiosis, chromosome images, and actually a number of other ideas are all in this demo. So we spend the good part of a class period going through that particular demo. And so what I have found with my students, I've been using this concept assessment tool for two years now. And with my students, what I found on question number 20 is what I've added on to the figure on the far right side and marked with an asterisk. And that is that the students at the beginning of the semester, like the author's students, which is what most of the figure is illustrating, come in and 12 to 13% of them get that right. And at the end of the semester, I'm finding that it's a little more than 52% are getting that question right. So I, I think they're learning it. I'm pretty happy. I'd like to have it all the way up. But I'm, I, I think that there is some acquisition there in terms of understanding. And that kind of takes us back to the important question. Did this help? Was this a part of that learning gain? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> and the reason why I don't know is that I've been doing this with my students longer than I've been doing the concept assessment. So I've got two ideas. The first idea is this fall, I could omit this and see if my learning gains drop, and if so, by how much. I'm not interested in doing that either. That's not part of the plan. Instead, what I plan on doing is identifying where the learning gains are still the most modest for my students, and I should say for me. I gotta take some responsibility here, right, if the learning gains aren't what I want them to be. And so where we're not making those gains, develop new additional paper-based demos that target those concepts and then determine whether or not adding just one of those demos improves the learning gain for that population of students. So that's where I'm actually planning on going and something that obviously any of you could do as well. So that's it. <laughs>